far in listen only mode. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this month's webinar from Alarm Corp. Today's topic is CCTV fundamentals, light and cameras. My name is Piotr Tolecki and I am the National Product Manager of CCTV at Alarm Corp. Thank you for joining. First, a little bit of housekeeping. Some of you may have used the meeting before, others may have not. So for the benefit of those who haven't, let's just take a look at what we can do with GoToMeeting. You will see the grab tab on your right. Notice, first of all, there is a microphone button. It is crossed out. You will be muted for the duration of the presentation. Next, above that, is the raise hand icon, and you can use that to grab my attention at any time during the webinar. Just to verify that you can all hear me and see the screen, can I please get you all to click on your raise hand icon? Okay, great. I'm seeing lots of hands going up. That's wonderful. Okay, can you all put them down? Thank you. Next, there is the questions section. You are welcome to type your question in at any time during the webinar and we will go through the questions at the end in the order that they are received. When you have done a question, make sure you hit the send button. Okay, on to the agenda. This webinar will cover the following. What is light? the color temperature of light and color rendering index, light sources as applicable to CCTV, some camera sensor fundamentals and implications for camera sensor and lens selection and also some general design issues considerations. With that, let's begin. Let there be light. Without light there can be no CCTV. In this webinar we look at light and what happens in front of the camera, in the lens and at the camera sensor. And What's useful about this approach is that this is very much technology independent because it doesn't matter whether we are talking about an analog camera or an IP camera, whether it's an MPEG-4, MJPEG or H.264, whether it's even PAL or NPSC because really we are looking at what happens out in the real world before the light reaches the actual camera sensor and is processed. Okay, what is light? Visible light is a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. It consists of the familiar colors that we see in the rainbow. Each color has a corresponding wavelength and hopefully most of you have seen the effect of what happens when white light is passed through a prism. You get this spread of the various colors or of course the rainbow. Color temperature of light. Color temperature is expressed in degrees Kelvin. It is a measure of how hot an object must glow in order to emit a particular color of light. And the best example of this is imagine putting a metal poker in a fire. As it gets hotter and hotter, it will eventually start glowing first a dull red, then a brighter red, then an orange, then yellow, eventually it get to white hot. Now assuming the metal wouldn't melt, you could actually get the metal to be glowing blue. Another example is a filament of a light bulb that's being controlled by a dimmer. As you wind the dimmer down, you'll see that the light starts, the filament starts going redder and redder event until eventually it's just barely glowing. Okay, sunlight has a color temperature of 5,000 degrees Kelvin. This is, des this is described as pure white light. A warm white compact fluorescent lamp is in the range of 2700 to 3200 degrees Kelvin. This is why it appears more yellow than sunlight. And a daylight compact fluorescent bulb is in the range of 4800 to 5200. Now this is the implication for CCTV. Here we see colors rendered by typical sunlight. Here we see colors rendered by a typical yellowish incandescent bulb and notice straight away that the overall tone of the image is a lot more yellow. And finally, talking about compact fluorescent bulbs, notice the difference between these two bulbs. One is warm white, the other one is daylight, yet they are both classed as white light. And obviously, if you used a camera to look at an image, you would see slightly different colors under both of those light sources. Now let's look at light spectrum, full spectrum light versus monochromatic light. Sunlight is white light. We have seen that this is a full spectrum light made up of many colors. Recall the example of the prism. Now the color temperature of light depends on the relative proportion of all the colors. Monochromatic light is a single wavelength light, for example a blue laser or a red or a blue LED. 
Now notice on the in the chart on the left you see a typical output of sunlight. And the thing that really sticks out about this chart is how even the output is or the relative proportions of the various colors. And the key point in this slide is that only full spectrum light can produce color accurate images within CCTV because we see an object's colors by the colors that it absorbs and it reflects. If you illuminate an object with a monochromatic light such as a green laser or a red LED, the object can only ever appear to be the color of the monochromatic light. Light sources. Sunlight is the ideal light source for CCTV and that is because CCTV has traditionally attempted to see things the way the human eye sees things and the human eye has had millions of years to evolve to work with sunlight. Sunlight is also ideal because it is absolutely free and there is no maintenance required for sunlight. Now artificial light artificial visible light in particular, attempts to reproduce sunlight. Now some light sources do this better and others do it not so well. Here we have a sample spectrum of a halogen incandescent lamp and notice that there is a lot more light output in the yellow and red portion of the spectrum as opposed to the blue spectrum. So this is why halogen looks a lot more yellow than sunlight. Next we look at a sodium vapor lamp and this is typical of the street lamps that you see on major roads around Australia. Notice that most of the light output is very much in the yellow and orange part of the spectrum with very little output in any of the other portions. So this is why the sodium street lamps look so predominantly orange. Next let's talk about color rendering index or CRI. CRI is a measure of color accuracy. It is a measure of how well the light source reproduces colors. Now we have said sunlight is the ideal light source. Sunlight has a CRI of 100%, meaning it gives you the most accurate color reproduction. The emitted light spectrum and the color temperature of a light source determine the color rendering index. Now nearly all artificial light sources have a lower CRI than sunlight. In general, the more complete a spectrum is, the higher the color rendering index because we have more colors being emitted. Now this has obvious implications for CCTV if color accuracy is important. Particularly if you're getting, say, a sodium street lamp. Was it an orange cow or was it a red cow? Or was it really dark orange? See here we have a the spectrum we showed before. This is sunlight. Again, notice the relatively flat output. Next to it is the light output of a modern white LED such as, as in the ever popular LED lens or torch. Notice again we have most of the colors but the graph is nowhere near as flat as that of sunlight. So a white LED light source does not have as good a CRI as sunlight. And again what we showed before the sodium street lamp again which has a very sharp peak in the yellow and orange part of the spectrum. So here we have some sample CRIs of various light sources. Sodium pressure, low pressure sodium vapor is 5, which is very, very poor. The high pressure sodium is 49, which is ordinary. The triphosphor white fluoros, which are used in offices all around Australia, are at 76, which is just okay. The ceramic metal halides, which is what you see being used in sports stadiums is 96 which is very very good and halogen incandescent is 100 and that's one of the reasons you see halogen down lights being used in shop display windows particularly for clothes because they give very accurate color reproduction despite being somewhat more yellow than sunlight. Now what is the consequence of color rendering index on what we see? In this example we see three photos of a tissue box and notice that as the color rendering index decreases, the colors become more subdued and in actual fact the colors become less accurate. To give you another example, here we have a comparison of three color charts. On the left we have a color chart that's being illuminated with a nearly ideal light source and notice that each of these color patches is rendered very accurately. 
in the middle we have the same color patches being illuminated by a fluorescent lamp which has got a slightly worse color rendering index and notice two things first of all that some of the colors are bleeding into one another in other words you cannot you can no longer differentiate between some colors and that most of the colors are no longer fully accurate and finally on the right we have the same color patch being illuminated with a high pressure sodium lamp which as we said before has got a peak output in the orange to red spectrum and again what do we see is that other than the blue color and the red color virtually everything else appears a shade of yellow so this goes to highlight again that a light with low coloring low color rendering index is a very poor choice for CCTV if color accuracy is important in our application. Now let's talk a little bit about artificial light sources. We can classify light sources into hot light sources which produce both visible light and infrared and a good example of this is an incandescent bulb which, no surprise, produces light by the action of heating a filament. And hot light sources work best with day-night cameras that are sensitive to infrared. If we look at cold light sources, these produce visible light with virtually no infrared component. And a good example of this is white LED light sources and fluorescent tubes. Now you can use these with all color or day-night cameras, however, you will not get optimal performance with a camera that's sensitive to IR because a cold light source does not produce any infrared. Next, let's talk about dedicated infrared light sources. These produce a monochromatic IR light output, which is invisible or nearly invisible to the naked eye. Traditionally, IR has been filtered halogen. Today, virtually all infrared sources are with LEDs, which give you much better life and much lower power usage. However, if you are going to use an infrared light source, you must use a camera that's sensitive to IR. Here we have a picture of a typical modern LED array for that's being used as an IR illuminator and of some pictures of some metal highlight bulbs just for reference. This is what's used typically for your factory down lights and also for your for your uh, sports stadium lights. And finally we have a compact fluorescent light uh, that are becoming more and more common in households around Australia. Now compact fluorescent lights like normal fluorescents do not produce any infrared. And finally we have the good old-fashioned incandescent light which is being phased out. Okay, so how does one choose a light source for CCTV? The choice of artificial light source depends on the size of the area to be lit and the light distribution. Do we want a wide floodlight? Do we want a spotlight? The required lux level and this has implications for camera sensitivity whether the light is to be visible or invisible and this is something that we will discuss in a bit more detail later. The level of aggressivity or over illumination. How is the light to be distributed? And this leads us into allowable light pollution and light trespass which is the unintended illumination of areas outside our coverage. Um, and those of you who have ever seen the MCG lit up at night or li live next to a sports so you would know all about light pollution. Next, budget. Both the installation budget and running costs. Maintenance issues. How easy will it be to get up to the light tower and replace the light source? And the accuracy of color reproduction. Is it important for our application or is it not important? And this is going to vary depending on the application. Visible light versus infrared. Visible light will give you the option to display accurate colors. Infrared light will give you either black and white images or green images as we see here in this photo. Visible light will give you bright areas and shadow areas. Infrared light does not show this unless somebody is looking at the image with special infrared sensitive goggles. However, if you have visible light any culprit or, or intruder will be silhouetted across a, across a visible light area. So visible light can be a deterrent. However, residents may complain about light pollution. Infrared light is invisible. There is no light pollution and there is no silhouetting. However, it has less deterrent value and you cannot get color images. 
Some examples of light. Typical VIP residence or expensive home that's been lit reasonably tastefully. And again, here we see visible light and anybody crossing in front of this residence would be silhouetted. Here we have an example of gross over illumination and light pollution. And you can see that in this example there is just so much light that it's almost unusable. Light pollution. Concept of sky glow. If you were to look at the night sky in a rural area, you would see many, many stars. If you were look to look at the same light at the same area of sky within the city, you would see very few stars. This is because you have reflected light and light spill from street lamps, residences, stadiums, cars, etc. Now, one of the good things about sky glow in a city area is that it's never completely dark. So you can actually use that a little bit to some advantage in a CCTV installation. Quality of light. Soft light versus harsh light. What is soft light? Soft light is omnidirectional light many sources, there is no single source of glare. So you have no sharp shadows and a very gradual transition from light to dark. You have fairly uniform illumination and the best example of soft light is a typical indoor office or outside under cloud cover. Soft light is the best light for CCTV. Just about any camera will work. Harsh light or aggressive light? We have very bright very directional light sources. There are very sharp shadows, abrupt transitions from light to dark, and a very high contrast between the bright areas and shadow areas. And examples of harsh light would be an entrance into a house, a factory with a roller door being up, an underground car park entry or exit. Harsh light is a lot harder to handle, and you will often need a camera that's capable of wide dynamic range to handle harsh lighting situations. Measuring light intensity. Lux is the standard measure of light. Lux defines luminous flux per unit area. And in essence, the single smallest unit of light is a single photon. High luminous flux means there are lots of photons. Low luminous flux means there's only a few photons. If it's pitch black like inside a cave, there are no photons. The best analogy of this is rainfall per unit area. In practice, we use a lux meter. Now, the reason we talk about photons per unit area will become apparent in the coming slides. Outdoor light levels. Some typical examples of outdoor light levels. We see that the light varies all the way from 100,000 lux in full sunlight down to about 0 0.001 of a lux on a moonless night. Key takeaway, there is a huge difference in levels and therefore outside applications will typically require higher grade cameras because we need a camera that can handle this massive difference in illumination levels. If we look at indoor light levels, we have, first of all, a lot lower light level than outside, typically a few hundred lux, and notice also that there is a lot less variation in the illumination level. This is why in many indoor applications you can get, get by with fairly basic cameras, such as plastic dome cameras that, that do not have very high, highly specified sensors or DSPs because you do not have such challenging lights to, to deal with. Now let's look at camera sensors and light. All camera sensors contain an array of pixels. Standard cameras have approximately 440,000 pixels. A 1.3 megapixel camera has approximately 1,280 by 960 pixels. And as you go down up to 2 megapixel and 5 megapixel cameras, the number of pixels increases. Now, megapixel cameras typically have smaller pixels than standard cameras. This is why most megapixel cameras are less sensitive to light because a smaller pixel will catch fewer photons. And the analogy is, if you wanted to catch falling rain, you will catch more rain with a bigger bucket than you will with a smaller bucket. Again, if we look at this in comparison, here's the pixel from a standard camera. If we go to a 1.3 megapixel camera, we have roughly four pixels in the space of a one normal pixel. Therefore, each pixel is a quarter of the size. 
and as you increase the pixel count, unless you increase the sensor size, the pixels have to get smaller. Now we can of course keep increasing the sensor size, but if we increase the sensor we need bigger lenses and we need bigger housings and the whole system becomes more expensive. Now let's talk about how cameras respond to light. Let's revisit our old friend the halogen lamp output. We saw earlier just a portion of the spectrum. Because a halogen lamp works by heating an ink and ink a filament, most of the light output or most of the energy is actually lost as heat. So we see here that the vast portion is infrared light which is invisible to the naked eye. Now different types of cameras respond to light differently. A color camera or a day-night camera in day mode will respond to the visible light portion. An infrared extend camera such as a True Vision IR dome responds to visible light and some infrared. Whereas a true day-night camera with a mechanical IR filter will respond to visible light and infrared light when in the night mode. This is why a true day-night camera will always give you best performance with a halogen type light source. Now let's talk about surface reflection. We see objects by the amount of light they reflect. Now different lights, different surfaces reflect different amounts of light. If we look at asphalt or earth, the reflectivity is quite low. This is why asphalt appears very dark. If you look at gravel or red bricks or bare concrete, we see that sort of we're in around the 13 to 40 percent reflectance range. If you look at fresh white paint or snow, they reflect a lot more light. This is why if you ever go up to the snow fields, it is so glary because most of the light that's hitting the surface is being reflected back to you. Now the key point of this is a camera sees reflected light and this is important when specifying illumination levels. You know, if you have say 10 lakhs of light, however only 10% of that light is being reflected, then in actual fact your camera is only seeing 1 lux. The difference in reflectivity between various objects is also useful when specifying indoor paint schemes. Let's say you have a situation where you wish to record people moving in and out of the building. People will be typically wearing clothes that are mid-tone, so the, ref the reflectance range will be around that of gravel or red bricks. If you paint that inside of the building bright white and have a bright white floor, you might be inadvertently creating a wide dynamic contrast situation which might require a wide dynamic capable camera. So that's just something that's worth remembering. Implications for cameras. Changing color temperature and color rendering index can be problematic. In a situation where we want to have perfect colors at all times, camera electronics tries to adjust its response either by automatic white balance, automatic traffic, or auto tracking white balance, known as AWB and ATW. Different cameras work differently and not all cameras work e equally well at all times. And this might require on-site adjustment. Here we have an example of a typical commercial installation and entry to an office building. And here the camera is doing reasonably accurate color reproduction. However, the same camera can struggle if the light source changes, for example, under a dawn or dusk condition. In this case, what's happened is that the color temperature of the light has gone outside the camera's range and the result is incorrect color reproduction. However, whether or not this is a problem really depends on the application. What am I wanting to see? In the bottom example, yes, the colors are not accurate. However, you would still see if somebody was walking into the building. Lenses. Good lenses are critical to good images. Not all lenses perform equally well. Normal lenses are not suitable for infrared sensitive cameras. If we look at a lens, a typical lens is an array of several glass elements. In an ideal world, all the light that hits the lens is transmitted back to the image sensor at the other side. However, if we have a poorly designed lens, we will have a lot of 
internal reflections. Now this will cause ghosting, it will cause glare, and it will cause overall washed out images. Spherical aberration. More and more we're seeing lenses with aspherical elements. One of the reasons for this is that a spherical lens cannot focus light across its whole area to the same spot, whereas an aspherical lens can do this. The net result is that a well-made aspherical lens can produce a sharper image. And this becomes more critical as we move on to megapixel cameras, because there's no point in having an ultra-sharp megapixel camera if the image is soft. Right, if we look at normal glass, normal glass can scatter light, which can re lead to color fringing. Specially corrected low dispersion glass will again result in a much sharper image. And finally, infrared versus visible light. White light is focused to a different spot than infrared. Infrared light is longer wavelength an infrared corrected lens will focus both visible light and white light to the same spot. Here we have an example of some various lens tests that have been done online. The make of each lens is not as important as the fact that you cannot see there is a big difference in proportion. Some of the lenses are sharper and some show visible color fringing. Okay, conclusions. Correct lighting is critical for a CCTV system. We need to match the light source to camera type. We need to match the light source to application. We need to understand the implications of choosing one or the other. Understand the impact of light level, surface reflectivity and camera sensitivity. And finally, we need to match the lens to the type of light being used. If we're using visible light, we don't need to use a lens that's IR corrected. Likewise, if we have a camera that is not sensitive to IR, we don't need to use an IR capable lens. However, if we do have a day and night camera and we are using light with an infrared component, we have to use an IR corrected lens. Okay, this brings us to the end of the presentation. Would you like to know more? More information can be found online at our website, alarmcop.com.au. If you haven't done so, I would urge you to subscribe to the Alarm Corp Pulse to receive new product information automatically. You can register online to get full access to the e-commerce platform. And contact your newest Alarm Corp representative. The contact details are below. The following webinars will still be held in 2011. In November, we will be holding a webinar on megapixel cameras, mega performance on Megamyth. Alarmco will also be hosting a range of access control and intrusion detection webinars. Please contact Jeff Rushton for more details or go to our website and click on the following link, Alarmco online, and then select webinars. And finally, webinars for 2012 will be published in January 2012, so stay tuned. We look forward to your participation. And now over to, no, not yet questions. If you haven't done so already, please visit our website. Keep checking back regularly for regular specials. And now over to question time. Please feel free to type in a question and hit send.